I'm going to start as Muslims do in the name of God in Alhamdulillah was salatu was salamu ala rasulillah to proceed. My dearest brothers and sisters in humanity, I greet you with the greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Today, we're going to be talking about a man that came from the 7th century Arabia that I believe changed the world. And this man is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon whom be peace. Now, the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, he had a claim, he made a claim 1400 years ago. And this claim, I believe, is an eternal claim. And it lasts the test of time. The reason I'm saying this is because we can articulate a very positive argument using our rational capacity, our reasoning, our intellect, our common sense. We could use this to assess whether his claim was true. And this claim was, I am the messenger of God. I am the messenger of Allah. And interestingly, we can assess this claim in the following way. Number one, he was actually lying. Number two, he was deluded. Number three, he was both lying and deluded. Number four, he was speaking the truth. And there is a fifth hidden one, which is that it's based on legend. That the whole history concerning his life and even his claim is legendary, meaning that we can't really believe in the Islamic historical narratives. So let's continue with using our mind, using our rational faculties and capacity and assess this logical structure, these logical possibilities. So let's take the first one. Could he be lying about his claim? He made a claim that he was the final messenger of God. Could he be lying? Well, let's look at his life. I would argue to claim the Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace a liar would be equivalent to rejecting that our own mothers are our mothers. Why am I saying this? Is because, for example, what is the proof that we have that my mother is my mother? Or your mother is your mother? We don't have any proof. I mean, no one's going to claim they have a DNA certificate at home and that's the only reason they believe that that's why their mother is their mother. No, of course not. Why do we believe truthfully, with certainty, that our mothers are our mothers? The only reason we do that is because of what we call authentic and valid testimony. The testimony of your own mother, the testimony of your father, of the doctor, of the midwife. So you have four or five testimonies, if you like, that show with good reason that your mother is your mother. But interestingly, we have 10,000 authentic and valid testimonies concerning the truthfulness of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. And these were the 10,000 companions of the Prophet Muhammad. So this is interesting. I mean, if these testimonies are true, then if we reject them, it's like rejecting our own mother because we only have about four or five testimonies for our own mother. But for the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, we have 10,000. And this is an interesting argument via the, the epistemology of testimony, if you like, which is epistemology means the study of knowledge or the study of belief. And testimony, when it's authentic and valid, is actually a valid source of knowledge. But there is a greater argument against claiming that the Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace is a liar, which is to claim he's a liar would be to claim that no one has ever spoken the truth because the psychological profile of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace is not in line with the profile of a liar. I studied psychology at university and when you look at the life of Muhammad as a man, you would see that it's impossible to claim he was a liar. Why? Because he had a simple message. His simple message was, La ilaha illallah, which basically means there is no deity worthy of worship but the deity, Allah, al ilah the deity. And he wanted to announce this to mankind regardless of context. I mean, he was offered riches, power, women, money, everything. And he rejected it just for the message. He was tortured. His companions were tortured and killed. He was so hungry when he was boycotted from his beloved city Mecca. But he was tying two stones to his stomach. He traveled to a town in Arabia called Ta'if. And he told them, just worship the one true God. And children of the town would stone him for hours. 
and the blood was running down his legs where the historians and the scholars say that his sandals were stuck to the sand. He made all of these sacrifices just for a simple message of La ilaha illallah. We also know he was very brave. In the battle of Hunayn, when he was defending Muslims and non-Muslims of the state. There were thousands of arrows in this battle. And his companions and the army had to inevitably retreat. But he was still marching forward and he said, I am the messenger of God. I am not a liar. Such bravery. How can this be the product of a liar? How can this life resemble the life of a liar? Because we know from a psychological perspective, a liar lies for some worldly gain. Honor, glory, riches, power. He rejected all of this. He was poor. There was no smoke coming out of the house of his wife for six months, meaning there was nothing to cook. So really, just think about it. Is this a man who we can claim is a liar? The onus of proof is on the one who's making the claim that he's a liar. We have no proof when we look at his life. This is why I say to say that Muhammad upon whom be peace is a liar is to claim that no one has ever spoken the truth. So we know he couldn't have lied. Let's go to the next option. Maybe he was deluded. Maybe he was crazy or he was a madman. Now, we know this straightaway can't be true just by looking at his teachings. Look at his teachings, his prophetic teachings known as a hadith, plural or hadith in singular in the Arabic tradition. Now, his teachings are quite phenomenal. phenomenal. For example, he said that true richness is not having riches, but it's having a rich soul, having a content, rich soul. He said there is no harming and no reciprocating of harm. He also said, لَا يُؤْمِنُوا أَحَدَكُمْ حَتَّى يُحِبَّ لِيَخِهِ مَا يُحِبُّ لِنَفْسِهِ This is the Arabic version, and in English it means you don't truly believe unless you love for others what you love for yourself. The Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace said, if you don't show mercy, you will not be shown mercy. The Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace said that when you put compassion and kindness in something, it elevates it. If you remove kindness and compassion, it degrades it. And we have various other prophetic traditions concerning geopolitics even. The Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace peace said, that the son of Adam, the human being, all he needs is food, shelter and clothing, which he defined the essential limited needs, which creates an economic philosophy of distribution, unlike the one that we have in capitalism, which is false actually, which says there are too many needs and not enough resources. It's a false geopolitical reality, where we know according to the Food Agricultural Organization, that there are enough calories on this planet to feed three planets. So are these teachings, the product of a deluded man? Of course not. But there is an even stronger argument because when we look at his life, there were, very, there were various instances and context that he could have used to support his delusion. For example, he could have said, yes, that happened because I am truly a prophet. I must be right. But he didn't do that. An example of this is there was an eclipse of the moon when his son Ibrahim passed away at early age. And all the Arabs said, he passed away because, rather the eclipse happened because your son passed away. But the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace said, no, an eclipse happens for no one's death. So we have no good reason to believe he's deluded by looking at his teachings and looking at his life. Could he be both? Well, we know he wasn't a liar and he wasn't deluded. So if you add both things that are not true, then it's still not true. So he couldn't be both. So the best explanation is that he was speaking the truth. It's a very simple, profound argument. But remember the fifth option, there was a hidden option, which is it's legendary. Because if you do like, look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, actually you can only conclude he was speaking the truth. This is why Professor Montgomery Watt in his publication, Muhammad at Mecca, he said to claim Muhammad an imposter creates far more problems than it solves. So if you do look at his life, you know that he must have been speaking the truth. The only counter argument is that his life is based on legend, it's not true. But this is a false misrepresentation 
of the Islamic historical science. Because the way the Islamic scholars preserved history concerning the life of the Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace is actually a very robust method. It is called in the Arabic tradition Ilmul Hadith, the knowledge of Hadith. And it's an amazing science because what we have is not only a text, which is called the Matan, but an Isnad, which is a chain of narration. And everybody in the chain of narration must have met each other, okay? Like A must have met B, and B must have met C, and C must have met D. And each person in that chain must have a biography, which is called Ilmur Rijal, the science of people. And we have 10,000 biographies of narrators. And we must conclude they were truthful, that they never lied. They were not sinful. They know what they were not unrighteous. So we know that they're all valid, authentic or validated people along this chain. And this is a very brief glimpse at the history of science from the Islamic perspective. So we have a mutton, a text, and we have a chain of narration. And this is quite profound because each person along the chain is authenticated. This doesn't even happen in Western history sometimes. I mean, to reject the Islamic model would be to reject Aristotle because we know Aristotle only came to us via Plato. Or it is to reject 1066, the Battle of Hastings in England because those narratives came via testimony as well, whether it's written testimony or oral testimony. And our science is quite detailed because we have biographical data of everyone along the chain of narration. Now, obviously, you have various scholars like Shah and others who say that, you know, we can't trust these narratives because they're biased. But when someone claims bias, they, they have to prove it. Because when you look at these prophetic traditions, you have some that claim the Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace fell off his horse. There are some women who came to the Prophet Muhammad and showed them the sanitary towels. I know that's very crude. But the reason I'm mentioning these prophetic traditions is to show that these were contrary to the Arab culture. So for you to claim bias, you need to prove bias. Because the, these traditions go contrary to the Arab culture at that time. So the bias claim is not a valid claim. There's also another claim, according to Shacht, the Orientalist. And he says, well, we don't have any early Isnads or early prophetic traditions recorded textually. This is actually false. We have various compilations in the very early period of Islam. Now, obviously, this is a big topic, but I just want to show the robust nature of the way we record our history. And to reject our history is equivalent of rejecting the Battle of Hastings, the existence of Aristotle. So we've dealt with this contention, therefore we can still claim that the Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace was actually speaking the truth. Thank you very much for listening.